This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is Twiv, This Week in Virology, episode 891, recorded on April 19th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. It's fun to be back. I'm out of touch with how to do this, so I haven't <laughs> checked the weather yet. Um, let's see. Uh, we had snow uh, yesterday, which, you know, it just kind of threw everybody for a loop. It's 42 degrees Fahrenheit right now, and that's, um, what is it, in Celsius, uh, waiting for the Norway weather app. Uh, it says eight Celsius. Yeah, we're going through a cold spell. It was like beautiful on Thursday, Friday. Yeah. Now it's cold again. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. 69 degrees and cloudy. Meh. Ah, not such good weather for Austin. And from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Uh, it's actually 47 degrees and on and off rain. Even more meh. It's raining out there. Yeah, here it's sunny, but uh, yeah. really chilly today. Very very strange weather. All right, today we have three guests who you're going to love. <laughs> I'm giving you a hint. <laughs> now, the first is uh, from Boston, coming back for her third uh, TWIV, Elke Mühlberger. Welcome back. Hi. So, I'm glad to be here. I have no clue what the weather is in Boston. Actually, let me look out the window. Sunny and rainy. So Elka was on TWIV 200. It was a, wow, that was only in 2012, but many episodes ago. Uh, that was when we visited uh, the NIDA. We did the TWIV right in your little training room there next to the conference room. That was fun. Right. Sir. And then you were also in Threading the Needle, the, the documentary we made about uh, the, uh, well, the High Containment Laboratory. That was a lot of fun to do that. Also joining us uh, today from Boston, Adam Hume. Welcome to TWIV. Hi. Nice to be here. You're in the same building as Elka, right? Yep. A couple doors down. And I learned before that you were there when we did that uh, TWIV in uh, 2012. You were already there. Yeah. And from a bit farther away in Hungary, Gabor Kemeneshi. Welcome. Hi, everybody. And you can tell it's night there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's night. What time is it? It says it's rainy, 9 p.m. Okay. Yeah, not too bad. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. This is normal time for you to be working, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so the reason we are doing this, well, the reason is because it's a cool virus we're going to talk about. And might as well start talking about other viruses. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> You know, I, I I have I asked Elka how to pronounce it. It's it's spelled L O V I U, right? Is that right? L O V I U. L L two L's O V I U. And every I'll ask everyone how to pronounce it, but I say love you virus. I think that's the best. But Elka, how how do you say it? So I actually don't really know. So <laughs> we say Yobi U, but others say Jovi U. So it is named after a cave in Spain. Okay. And it seems that only Spanish speak, uh, speaking people know how to pronounce it. It's funny. But there seems to be differences. So we work on it, but we do not know how to pronounce <laughs> it. <laughs> I think that's funny. Ad Adam, how would you say it? I mean, I usually say Yavu just because that's my limited Spanish understanding. That's Yavu. how okay. I thought. How about you, Gabor? Yeah, same with me. I started with Joviu and now it's Joviu, but <laughs> both. <laughs> anyway, that's the virus we're going to talk about because Elka wrote and said, it is my new pet virus. So how can you resist something like that? And if we, we talked about Elka's training way back on TWIF 200. So let's talk with uh, Adam and Gabor about uh, their, their background a bit. Adam, uh, tell us a bit about your, your uh, history. Um, sure. I, I mean, I don't know how far you want me to go back. Where, uh, where, where are you from? Oh, I'm, I'm from, uh, the North shore of Massachusetts, about an hour North of Boston, close to the ocean. 
Um, I went to undergrad at Bates College. It's a small liberal arts college in Maine. I worked for a year in Boston as a tech, and then I went to grad school at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and I focused, my research project there was focused on human cytomegalovirus. Um, I was in the lab of Dr. Robert Kaleda. Mm-hmm. And then I came in 2010, I came out here and uh, joined Elka's lab as a postdoc and um, have been in her group since then. Um, but was uh, this past fall was uh, promoted to a research assistant professor here in the microbiology department at BU. Okay. Kapoor, how about you? Yeah, I did my degree, biology degree here in Pech. I'm from Hungary and I'm still in Hungary, as you know. Uh, I worked first for with uh, West Nile virus and mosquito-borne viruses, and then I switched to bat viruses in uh, 2012. And since then, I do this virus hunting style virology, which is mostly field virology. And since 2017, we have a biosafety level four lab. Mm. I'm the deputy leader, and we are working with different viruses, but mostly getting them from the jungle, from the wild, like Chovio virus, and then start to work with them. And uh, this is the story. I did my PhD at the University of Pech. I did my biology degree at the University of Pech. And this lab is also at the University of Pech in Hungary. So Pech is a relatively small city, is that correct? It's a typical university town, so middle-sized in Hungary. Okay. A lot of students, nice buildings. How many BSL-4 labs are there in Hungary? <laughs> two, two. What motivated um, your change from West Nile to studying bat viruses? Why did you do that? Uh-huh. It's it's a fun fact, but uh, since the last year, I started to connect these two topics. And now I do research on mosquito viruses, which can be transmitted to bats and uh, these kind of viruses which are circulating in caves. So it's it's really interesting and we see some patterns. So viruses are really, really interesting. So uh, it makes sense. So mosquitoes bite bats, right? And transmit viruses. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. But all of these viruses, which I work with, they are suspected zoonotic viruses or unknown viruses yeah. with uh, kind of zoonotic potential. All right, so let's start from the beginning. Uh, lo- love you, love you virus. How was it discovered? And, and whoever wants to tell us. And maybe that's a question for Adam. Mark. Sure. Um, so uh, the story of Yavi virus. Well, there were some a number of uh, die-offs of um, a particular species of bat, Schreiber's bats or Miniopteris schreibersi bats in Spain and Southern France in 2001. Mm -hmm. And, um, initially they suspected that it was rabies, but it was tested negative. And from my understanding sample, when they didn't find anything, samples were stored and frozen. And then, as newer technologies, particularly RNA-seq, came along and became more affordable, they took these samples and ran, you know, untargeted RNA-seq on those samples, identifying a viral sequence whose closest homolog was Ebola virus, and that's and that's how the virus was discovered. But um, they went back and um, they had samples from these bats. They tried to culture virus from these samples, but they were not successful. And then importantly for some of the subsequent subsequent work that we've done, um, another important fact is that um, for the RNA-seq analysis, they were unable to get the genomic ends um, and particularly um, uh, one end, the trailer end, uh, there was quite, or seems to be <laughs> quite a bit missing. We're still, still not quite sure exactly how much. Um, but the conserved um, sequences in the g- genome end required for um, replication of the genome and anti-genome that are found in all Ebola and Marburg viruses were missing. And so at 
did anyone try and take electron micrographs of material to see what it looked like? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, I don't know if they did from the, those initial samples. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have done some work with um, some of the recombinant viruses that we've developed, um, and we're working on that with um, some of the live, real <laughs> Yabi virus uh, mm -hmm. that Gabor was able, able to culture. So, so how did uh, how did the Mulberger lab get involved? Mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, this virus is super interesting. First of all, we have a long tradition in working with fetal viruses, including Ebola virus. And then there was this new virus. So, and it is in Europe. I mean, this is, I mean, super exciting for somebody who actually <laughs> comes from Europe. <laughs> and, um, but the genome was so peculiar. And this is because there was no intergenic region between two genes. So the beauty of all fetal virus genomes is that they have these patterns. So they have highly conserved transcription start and stop signals. And all of these genes are flanked by these start and stop signals. And they are actually really beautiful because they are highly conserved. They overlap and uh, they are conserved across all filoviruses. And there are so many new filoviruses right now. Maybe we talk about that a little bit later. But then with your view, there was this one intergenic region between uh, the L gene, which is the polymerase, and VP24, which is the gene uh, or protein that is required for nuclear capsid formation. And there was no intergenic region. So no stop uh, signal, no transcription stop signal for VP24, and no start signal for L. And that didn't make any sense. I mean, why would a virus do that, right? Have this destroy this beautiful structure all the other viruses have. So we wanted to know. And then Adam generated all these recombinant viruses. And since, as you just mentioned, the genome ends were not known, we just uh, complemented them with Ebola or Marburg virus sequences. And then and maybe Adam, you want to talk about that because I think that's really, really exciting result about the intergenic region. Because of course the virus needs it. Yes, it does. So the published sequence is wrong. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as Elka mentioned, uh, I made, uh, so we initially published a paper a few years before uh, this re recent paper where we we use many genome systems, which you take the genome ends um, and you flank a reporter gene, and it's a way to study viral um, transcription and genome replication. And for field viruses, you can, has the advantage of being able to do that at PSL2. Mm. And we made a system for Yavi virus, but we had to use the the five prime end of the genome from Ebola, Marburg, or Reston, different other field viruses. Um, I then made full length recombinant um, plasmids um, and using those uh, five prime ends and a three prime end that we identified that worked using the mini genome system and repeatedly and many times uh, I just failed and failed and failed <laughs> to rescue the virus. And then we finally decided, okay, we're gonna see if we insert a transcription stop and start signal into the vb 24 l intergenic region. Does this allow us to rescue the virus? Mm -hmm. And the first time I did it, mm. it was it rescued. Yeah. So, Elke, yeah, your, so, your, your gut sorry. feeling was right. Why would the virus... Course, I mean, <laughs> yes, it didn't make any sense. Why? I know my viruses. So, it was, you know, it's like you have a cute and then something is wrong with it and you immediately figure out what's wrong. But so, I got so obsessed with this intergen region that was missing that... Uh, so, when Gabor, and maybe Gabor talked a little bit about your work on your views, when he published a paper about discovery of real Yobiu, like the real virus in, in Hungary, I contacted him, like, please, please, can you send me the sequence? I really would like to know whether there is an intergenic region. So that is how we kind of started the collaboration. And so Gabor was so gracious and shared all the sequences with us. Yeah, maybe Gabor talk a little bit about that because I mean, he really found the virus in this very, very interesting and fascinating batch in the jungle yeah. of Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really started with the phone call. Elke called me on the phone and asked for the sequences and for the virus. But uh, we we started this whole Jovi virus hunting in uh, 
2013, when the Spanish colleagues, after Spanish colleagues published their paper, we started to do this passive monitoring of uh, Schreiber's bats in Hungary. And then in the first dead bats were found in 2013. And this year we lost 5% of the Hungarian population of these bats. So there was a massive die off in Hungary, but we couldn't find the virus. And then after three years after this event, In 2016, we found additional dead bats in a single colony in North Hungary. And within these bats, we were able to identify the virus, but in really low amount. And that was the reason why we couldn't sequence the virus. And after this event, we started to do the PCR on site and extensively sample these bats and do this active monitoring. And then we found positive bats we were able to get high quality samples and then we were able to to go on with the isolate and with the sequencing and everything which we do now. So, uh, Gabor, you got interested in this virus independently of, of Elka, right? Exactly, yeah. And why were, you, why were you interested in it? We are in really good, friendly connection with Hungarian bat researchers, many mm-hmm. of them. And when we heard this publication from the Spanish colleagues, we had this idea, why not to check on our uh, Schreiber's bats in Hungary? What's happening with them? And there are two bat researchers in Hungary who are actually working with this, with this species. And then we asked them to check on these, these bats. And we started to find these these die of events. And then we started to examine these die of events. And after a while, we were able to, to identify the, the, the real virus. And we shared the, the material of this virus with, uh, with British colleagues uh, for seropositivity studies. And then we shared the sequence and the other positive samples with, with the Boston colleagues. And we started to do to build up this huge collaboration, which we have now. What's the geographic range of the Schreiber's bats? It's huge. I mean, in Europe, it's Southern Europe, the Mediterranean basin with North Africa, and it expands to Turkey and parts of the Middle East. Hmm. So it's huge. Are they migratory? Do they get around much? Yes, they are migratory. They have uh, summer colonies, they have winter colonies, and they have uh, maternity colonies, and they are switching the places. And why this species is so special, they love to fly, and they can fly up to 500 kilometers. So they really mixed up. these. All these populations in Europe, we suspected this, and then we started other uh, other studies as well. And, and we see actually this, that they are mixing up uh, within this big, huge territory they are mixing up. So that's one reason why maybe we were able to find the virus do they, far away from Spain. Do they cohabit with other bat species as well or do they keep to themselves? Yeah, some bat species. Rhinolophus bats, myotis bats, some other species, yes. So is if you sample these bats, what fraction are going to be infected? What fraction are going to be seropositive with... Uh, your view? It's really interesting. Seropositivity is, is really similar to several other bat viruses. We see something like something around 10% seropositivity. But what about the actual positivity? We see the actual positivity exclusively in September, in the autumn period. Hmm. And this is about 1% of the animals. It's PCR so we have to sample a right? lot of, yes, this is PCR positive. And we have to sample a lot of animals and we can hmm. see this now for, we saw this actually in multiple years. And uh, this is not unique in bat viruses because in, su- in cases of Lista viruses, for example, really similar pattern was seen in EBVL1 or 2, this kind of autumn peak, this kind of seropositivity level. So this is kind of a bad, bad thing. <laughs> so I know that in your paper, um, you have some data on cross-reactivity um, in terms of uh, serology. Um, I guess, how much is known about serological cross-reactivity with filoviruses? And, and what did you see in terms of cross-reactivity um, in, in that serology? Okay, the problem was the same. So we have just a few positive samples mm. and these these bats are really tiny. Uh, so we can get like five to 50 microliters of blood. 
So we can get around 10 to 20 microliters of sera, which can be used for pseudotype neutralization assay. And so we were able to test some cross-reactivity, but not with all known uh, filoviruses. So we tested with Ebola, Zaire, and that's all. But there was no cross-reactivity. So because one reviewer asked us to test it, because what if there is the same pattern in Europe, which we see in, for example, in China, that we have a, a lot of different genetically diverse filoviruses, but we don't see this in Europe. We just see jovial virus. And by the way, we used, this is really important because we used uh, to support our PCR positivity uh, with the nested pan filovirus PCR, and we didn't find anything else, just jovial. Hmm. Does infection do anything to the bat? We don't know yet. I mean, we, we found these dead bats. And mm -hmm. in some cases, we saw some hemorrhagic symptoms on these bats. But we, we can say that there is a, there is a correlation between jovial infection and, and these kind of symptoms because we didn't find these symptoms in all positive bats, just in some cases. So we don't know yet. Are you planning to do some uh, infection studies of bats? Is that feasible? It's, wait, wait, wait. it's tricky. So <laughs> So I think maybe Gabor, you should talk about that because it's it's so fascinating. These bats are protected, so uh -huh. they are they, they are a species. What is it, what is the word for that? An endangered Highly species. Protected. It's an endangered species in Europe, and everybody in Europe loves bats. So if you kill the bat, you are mostly you go to prison. <laughs> so the way Gabor samples these bats is super fascinating because it has to be minimal invasive mm -hmm. and. Um, yeah, I mean, they do love their bats, right, Gabor? You love your bats. You would never, ever kill yeah. them. <laughs> yeah, we have to take good care of these bats. <laughs> I you, mean, how seriously. Do you, how do you do seriously. minimal invasiveness sampling? Tell us about that. We use anticoagulants. We take care of them. We put them in nice uh, uh, textile bags, weight them to stop the bleeding. And so we take good care of them. There are several methods to do this. And I think we developed a quite nice method. For them. But you have so, to catch them initially, right? Do you use a net, a mist net or something? We are lucky because this particular roost site, it's easy to access for humans. So they are close to you. You just grab them, ah. you take them, you take the sample and you bring them back to the cave and that's all. So do you do that yourself? We were lucky. No, I asked the bat researchers to do it for <laughs> me. <laughs> and oh. then I take the samples, yeah. <laughs> So uh -huh. in your paper, uh, Gabor, you talk about, I think it was in your paper, you talk about being able to do sequencing in the field. Is that yes. right? Yes. Uh, this fascinates me. What? This uh, is our favorite part. <laughs> uh, can you describe the technique and the, and the, and the equipment? Yes. There is this third generation sequencing technique, the nanopore sequencing technique. And we have, actually we have a, a colleagues from Belgium in the paper and they are real magicians with this technique. So we learned a lot from them. So we have this tiny sequencer machine. This is the Oxford nanopore sequencing machine. And it is, this is quite mobile. So you can take your sequencing machine, which is like, um, like a mobile phone sized machine and you take it to the field. And if you have a nice protocol and we developed our own protocol, it is an Amplicom based protocol. And I'm sure you had some, some episodes about SARS-CoV-2 and sequencing. This is really similar, which uh, many people use to sequence SARS-CoV-2. This is an Amplicom based sequencing method. So we amplify the genome in a, a multiplex PCR and then we sequence this. So basically we need around six to eight hours on the field to get the complete genome which is nice. And six to eight hours, it means that we can sample 80 to 100 bats during this. So it's, it's nice. <laughs> wow. We're getting closer and closer to a tricorder. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. <laughs> so when you uh, I, I isolated infectious virus from these bats, you, you got a sample, you got samples from your bat people, right? And you brought them into the lab and, and what did you do with them? The trick was that we used our mobile lab so we went to the field, we went to the cave, we used the real-time PCR on the field. So we were able to identify specific infected bats mm. and we were able to resample them. And we used these resampled samples, which were high quality 
freshly frozen, never thawed, and we use these samples for isolation. But we were lucky because we met Elke and the Boston colleagues, and they provided us the perfect cell line for this. This is the subcase cell line, which is a miniopterous cell line, by the way, and this is highly permissive for Jovi infection. Mm. But the cell line work was done in the lab, or was that done in the field also? No, it was done in the lab. We just freeze right. the sample on the field and we get back to the lab. We are lucky because we have a BSL-4 lab, so <laughs> we can do this work as well. And we started the isolation. We were lucky. Uh, so you say you were able to resample the bats. Were you uh, <laughs> hanging on to the bats while you were uh, between samples? Or are you able to identify them, uh, release them and re-identif re-identify them? How, how's this done? We keep them in textile bags. Meanwhile, okay. we are doing the, the real-time PCR. It takes 40 minutes now because we optimize a really fast uh, diagnostic test for them. So they just they are just resting in the textile bag. And then, then we see that, hey, guys, this is the positive. We just take it back, get some more sample, and then we release. What types of samples? Are they all blood samples or did you look at other compartments? We look at other compartments, but we had just a few positives. So we see at this stage that their blood is positive, sometimes highly positive, but no other body fluids, no swab sample, no urine, no feces. Uh, but which is interesting, we found positive ectoparasites. But this is another story. But yeah, that, that was quite interesting and shocking that these kind of special ectoparasites were also positive, not just the bats. So yeah, are, I think that the ectoparasite story is fascinating. <laughs> so now I'm curious. We, we have two parallel lines of research here, okay? And in, in uh, Elka's laboratory, since you can't get infectious virus, you're trying to build something uh, that will replicate that is Who mostly... Says we don't have... Oh, of course. So Gabor shared the virus with us. Now we have the real thing. Right, and, but, uh, but yeah. uh, I'm, I'm interested in the uh, comparison between the recombinant virus that you built uh, and the real thing, both yeah. in terms of, uh, you know, sequence and, uh, and its ability to replicate. So we are working on that. We actually don't have any data yet. And <laughs> one of the reasons is that um, the virus stocks are heavily contaminated with mycoplasma when they come from the bat. So first, mm -hmm. the first step is to really purify them to make sure that we have clean virus stocks and yeah. And I don't so, suppose these things form plaques. Um, well, they, they, yeah, maybe Adam can talk about it because he did actually the infections in the lab with, so with both the recombinant virus and um, the wild type of U virus. Yeah, Adam, maybe talk a little bit about the, the cytopathic effect and so on, yeah. Sure. Um, for the recombinant virus, definitely it causes cytopathic effect. I haven't specifically done plaque assays, but um, I mean, we've been titering with TCID50 assays, but I mean, clearly we see a um, cytic, cytopathic effect with those. Um, as Alka mentioned, we have a lot more limited uh, data with the, the live virus because we've been working with the recombinant virus. Um, uh, Good timing. We, I rescued the the first recombinant virus in May of 2020, just as we were starting to work on SARS-CoV-2 as well. Um, but uh, we've got the uh, the real thing from Gabor much more recently, and have been in the process of treating it to get rid of mycoplasma. Um, so I don't have. Uh, I mean, I saw some cytopathic effect, but I just want to confirm that with the, the, the clean virus now. So how close are the terminal sequences that you wound up using? How close are they to the real thing? So we still don't have the five prime angle. This is a headache and we don't really understand what's going on here. So it seems that you sequences are really peculiar. So we finally got the intergenic region from Gabor's isolate. And, and it seems that, it's not, it seems we know that about 400 nucleotides are missing in the published sequence. And this intergenic region is highly C-rich. <laughs> and actually we thought, so most likely it forms a very strong secondary structure. So we teamed up with an expert on RNA structures. It's uh, Michael Wolfinger at the University of Vienna. But very surprisingly, 
this sequence does not form secondary structures except two, right? There are two very strong structures, but other than that, it's completely free of secondary structures. It's completely strange and difficult to understand. So, and of course, what Adam is doing right now, and is, so you can talk about, uh, uh, about his work himself, but right now he's comparing this intergenic region with the recombinant viruses where we just added a minimal sequence which uh, contains the transcription start and stop signal. Now we have these 400 additional nucleotides which are super strange. And we believe that maybe something similar is going on with the five prime end because as I said, we just have a hard time to get it. And usually to get the five prime end of a non-segmented negative virus, it's like that. Not with this one, this virus okay. is really difficult. Um, yeah, as I just want, want to add that the, the newly identified intergenic region sequence we did find, unsurprisingly, has a perfect transcription stop, stop and start signal within it, too. Um, and then we went back with uh, Gabor's group and found in the RNA-seq data very rare reads that aligned to the sequence. It wasn't fully complete, um, like Elka mentioned, likely due to the high high C content, so maybe the um, the enzymes that are used in the RNA-seq are, uh, or for the amplicon process, uh, maybe they just have a difficult time with this sequence for whatever reason. Um, but we, we were able to find that. And now, yeah, we're, now that we have the real virus and uh, have a clean version of it, we're working to grow it up and to try different techniques to identify that missing trailer sequence. So, but, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Adam, when you were building the, the clones, what did you use? Did you have synthetic DNAs made or did you do any copying of yeah. transcripts or what? No, we had, we had synthetic. Okay. It was... Um, Piece together synthetically. And then, um, like I mentioned, the, the leader and trailer sequences we used by, uh, we, we identified using our mini genome system that were complemented with um, Ebola and Marburg virus sequences and, and rest of virus. And, um, and then, of course, the added um, intergenic region. We just used um, one, an overlapping um, transcription uh, stop and start signal, which found obviously elsewhere in the Yabu genome. So what kinds of cells can be infected by uh, this virus? Yeah, um, well, uh, that was one of the first things that we did when we got the recombinant virus. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, we grow the virus in vero cells. Um, it grows fine. Uh, of course, the, the sub-K cell line that Gabor mentioned, um, we obviously did quite a bit of work in that, and the virus grows quite well in there, and the virus grows well in human cells mm. as well. Um, yeah, including macrophages, which are a very important cell type, so human primary macrophages, a very important cell type for fetal virus infection. And um, so your U virus infects these cells mm. well. So it's, there's, it seems there is no problem for this virus to infect human cells. So the, the you're doing the work in BSL four just yeah. because you don't know what the potential threat is, right? You just want to be exactly, safe. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think at this point, all filo viruses are BSL four. Okay. So, so at least in the U.S. <laughs> for so, now. All right. So any if you anyone identifies a filo virus, you have to work on it on BSL four. Well, right? I mean, I, I think so. Although um, Alka mentioned it earlier, um, so. Uh, we published a review looking at mechanisms of uh, filovirus transcription and replication in late 2019. Um, and that was soon after a number of other filoviruses were identified. Um, again, similar to Yavu, they're missing the genomic ends, but mm. there was menglovirus, which was identified from bats in China. Right. Uh, there were uh, two different uh filoviruses identified in sequencing uh, of saltwater fish mm -hmm. off the coast of uh, China as well. Um, and then more recently, since then, there have been three freshwater fish filoviruses identified in Europe. 
and there it was a uh, filovirus identified in a pit viper in South America. Hmm. So the, the family is expanding quite a bit. Um, there's sort of no indication that these other viruses do anything to humans. And again, these are all all of these filoviruses are only identif- have only been identified based off of sequencing. None of them have been cultured, yeah. and they're all missing um, these genomic terminal sequences, which also, <laughs> at this point, kind of makes it impossible to rescue them. Um, but maybe sort of the template we put forth in this uh, in our recombinant Yavi paper is a way that these viruses could be studied at least to some extent until the full sequence is identified or the viruses are cultured. So I have two questions based on that. Um, one of them is that most of the examples of the filoviruses you listed, um, with the exception of the one from the pit viper, mm-hmm. um, were from uh, organisms in the Eastern hemisphere. <laughs> um, is that, say, with the bats... I was thinking about this with bats, but then we could extend it, I suppose, to fish or <laughs> to other organisms as well. Is that based on um, differences in the host species that are found, say, here versus in Europe? Or is that just a, a matter of um, surveillance? I think it's a matter of surveillance. I mean, you find them in fish, freshwater and saltwater. We find them in bats, right? Uh, Mangala, as well as Reston have been found in, you know, South Southeast Asia, East Asia, um, and also in snakes. I, I think filoviruses are pretty much everywhere. It's just we, you know, if we Gabor mentioned the the low positivity we found of filoviruses in bats when we when he's actively sampling them at the right time of year. I think it's a matter of sensitivity and finding it in the right spot. I think yeah. they're everywhere, probably. Okay, and I was sort of wondering, um, Gabor, um, what do you think uh, makes it challenging in some of these other cases to um, get a uh, virus that replicates? What did you do? Um, is it more about the live sequencing in the f- or field? Is it about the getting blood samples? Is it about how you didn't freeze the blood samples? Why do you think you were able to get this easier than uh, has been done in other settings? Okay, first of all, it's luck. It's about luck. It's about good, good, good collaborators at the right time. Uh, but uh, if we are not speaking about jokes, but yeah, collaborators are seriously matters. But uh, in, in in most of the cases, the biggest challenge is getting fresh and high quality sample. Just think about Bombali virus, for example. This is also a filovirus which was found in bats in multiple sites in Africa. And the main challenge is still getting fresh and nice mm-hmm. sample to use it for in vitro isolation experiments. Because they collect the samples in Africa, they do one PCR screening, this is one free saw cycle. Uh, they transfer it to laboratories, they use it again for in vitro isolation on I don't know which kind of cell line, usually Vero and uh, unsuccessful. And in our case, we were able to get fresh, high quality sample. We had the perfect uh, cell line. We had the perfect collaborators and then we were lucky. Yeah, so many things are necessary, but I believe that that first of all, the high quality sample is, it's it's critical. So I'm getting the impression now that Mm -hmm. filoviruses are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet how many have actually been isolated and cultured? authentic live viruses you know from the new viruses this no this just i mean total there's there's Uh-oh. ebola there's yeah. marburg there's reston there's love you virus what else <laughs> oh, well, sudan type forest yeah so um, okay. all the viruses that cause disease in humans have been isolated and so one of them which is also a very interesting virus which is Marburg virus because this has been isolated both from patients and also from infected bats it's mm-hmm. beautiful yeah. work by uh, John Towner's lab at CDC so yeah that's also they yeah. don't love their bats so much so <laughs> how many food. have act- so how many have been isolated from bats Two. as opposed to from humans so only 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 Marburg and Yavu have been identified from a species other than humans. Okay, 
So no. I, 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 where, where I'm going no, with Restin, this. Sorry, no, Restin has been isolated from non-infected non-human primates mm. um, that were shipped from Southeast Asia as well. Right. So where I'm going with this is I'm wondering how much is known about species barriers. Because this is all about, I mean, the motivation for this is, is understanding a potential for spillover, a major motivation, okay? And so I'm wondering from the studies that have been done from viruses that have been isolated, how much do we know about species barriers? So, I mean, you can say, for example, that uh, you can say things about the host range of in culture of love you virus, but I don't know what that means in terms of uh, yeah. real uh, species barriers um, in nature. So can you comment on this? This is yes. really tricky. Mm -hmm. This is tricky because if you think about Africa, this is a totally different ecological background than in Europe. So we speak about Europe, we speak about uh, uh, wintering habit of bats, we speak about the lack of primates, we speak about a lot of things which are extremely different than the African ecological background. So the answer for this, for example, in case of your view, is a lot of don't knows. We don't know. We don't know. We don't see yet. Uh, we see this kind of pattern in vitro, but we doesn't know anything about the real uh, natural setup of the circulation of the virus. Okay, we see it in the bats, we see some kind of seasonality, but we don't have any ideas about the spillover potential in Europe. So this is a big question. Okay. I found it very funny because I once asked Gabor if he has access to the serum of, of humans who actually are people who live close to these bats. Mm -hmm. <laughs> obviously, they are in such a remote area. There is nothing other than for people who actually collect the samples. I found that very funny. So there is obviously no contact between the population and these bats, right, Gabor? Yeah, these bats are really special. I mean, they they hate people. They hate to be close to people. So this is Mom, this is not the, this is not the type of bat which you can find in your I mean I don't know in your garden or in your barn or anywhere. So mm -hmm. they don't like. And this was my idea until last year or before last year when Italian colleagues called me and they told me a strange story. It's not filovirus. It's a lysovirus. And they told me that hey Gabor we. We see a strange situation here in Italy because this kind of Schreiber's bat, we found the colony in the city. And I said, no way, no. And they said, yeah, they had the same idea, but finally they found a colony within a major city in Italy. And this colony was infected with the Lissa virus, which was jumped to, to a cat. And this cat scratched some people. So this was a, this is a really good example for an intermediate, uh, intermediate host. So anything can happen in the age of emerging diseases. So after this situation, I think, I just don't know. These bats don't like people, don't like the proximity of people, but you never know. Italian bats are different, obviously. <laughs> so I, I'd uh, like, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I'd like to talk a little about the ectoparasites, because I found that fascinating that um, there's the hard ticks and then there's also this other family. I'm not going to try and pronounce it, but they're evidently, some of them include um, flies that have no eyes or wings. And I don't know how big the flies are. I've, I've now figured out that the, that the uh, bats are only about five or six centimeters long. So I'm imagining the flies are, are small too, but um, talk a little about the ectoparasites. Okay, these these bat flies, these bat flies, we call them bat flies. These are miracles of adaptive evolution. So they are highly connected to bats. You can imagine some kind of spider. They actually look like a spider, but uh, in biological terms, they are wingless flies, and they are uh, they are blood sucking ectoparasites. So we collected these ectoparasites along with uh, with some exodestics. And we found that the positive bats can have positive ectoparasites, which raises a lot of questions. But first of all, it is really good because we can use these ectoparasites if we don't want to get the blood sample directly from the bats because we want to keep them safe and calm. So we just collect the ectoparasites. We can tell that, hey, guys, this cave is infected with Jovi virus and things like this. But we still don't know what is the exact transmission route if there is any, uh, in relation to these ectoparasites. And nearly mm, at the same time, 
Pavascant colleagues, they published a nice paper about Marburg virus and, uh, and Nicteribidae bat flies. And they found similar things as we saw in case of UVU virus and, and this kind of nicteribidae. So at this point, again, a lot of questions, but this is really interesting. And these animals are really, really fascinating, really nice. So it seemed to me that you kind of divided them into three possibilities of, of natural vectors or mechanical vectors or just dead end hosts or, or dead end. Uh, yeah, wouldn't even necessarily be a host, yeah, so to speak. Host, yeah. 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 So uh, what's your, um, if you had to bet <laughs> or, or what's the evidence supporting any of those three types? We don't have too much evidence yet, but we sequenced the, the viral sequence from the ectoparasite and from the host, and we found totally the same viral sequence, which points towards the, the dead end host. But we never know, so we need more data to see the bigger picture. Maybe they can, in some cases, act as mechanical vectors. We, see, we know some examples for ectoparasite uh serving as mechanical vectors to viruses but at this point i think they are just dead end hosts but we will see we collect more samples and we we try to sequence more and and see some more patterns and are the uh bat flies something like do you just comb them off of the bats or you find them in the textile bags or or how do you actually get the, the bat flies uh, you hunt them down. <laughs> I mean, they, <laughs> they, they are literally running around the on the body of the bat. Uh, and you have to be extremely fast and, and accurate and you have to catch it. So, yeah, it's quite hard, but with some experience and practice, you can be a really good bat okay. fly hunter. <laughs> so they, they don't have wings, but they still can get around fast. Yeah, okay. yeah. Exactly. Is there, is can you have some in the lab? <laughs> can you have like a lab colony of them? No, but uh, Pavescant colleagues, they had, they had, you know, the problem with our uh, species, the Schreiber's, but this is uh, highly protected. So we can get bats to the lab and these ectoparasites can't alive for a long time without the host. So it's tricky to keep them. We try to feed them artificially. Uh, how we feed the mosquitoes, but they they didn't need the the blood of uh, other animals, just the bats. So it's tricky. It's tricky. Uh, so these flies are they highly species specific? Uh, some of them, most of them actually, but there are some data when these flies may switch hosts in case of co-roosting bats. But we don't know much about this. Uh, and is there any uh, evidence, one way or another, about whether or not the uh, virus actually replicates in the flies? No idea yet. I'm going back to your early days, Kathy, with mouse plots. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where you can I'm do, thinking of yeah. embedding a fly and doing some yeah. sort of in situ hybridization or something like that. See if you can see replication in fly tissues. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Gavor, what, aside from Spain and Hungary, where else have love use sequences been found? We started this collaboration with Italian colleagues and we found the virus in Italy. Okay. So we had this idea that if we see this species all around the Mediterranean basin and in a big geographical scale, uh, we should find the virus elsewhere. And yeah, we found it. So we found it in Italy. We are preparing a manuscript now, so it mm. will be out soon in, as a preprint. So yes, yes, it must be in many other places. Because as I told you, we see the, the mix of these populations. So why not to mix up the, the virus as well between these populations? And we see this pattern. But do you, um, do you I, think it's specific to where the, the Schreiber is or can it be elsewhere? So far, it's just Schreiber. Schreiber. And where else is Schreiber found? Other than, you said Europe, you know, a wide part of Europe. Anywhere else in the world? Uh, you know, this is a species complex, if I'm right. So there are many subspecies or yeah. different species, but closely related species all around Eurasia. Okay. But Schreiber's bat, it's just in the Mediterranean basin, in some parts of Europe and Middle East. Um, so we're learning that uh, filoviruses <laughs> are everywhere. Um, <laughs> Adam, can you tell us a little bit about the um, pathogenicity data in your paper um, in terms of comparing uh, pathogenesis, because that also, I mean, unsurprising given that I think about 
cytokines and pathogenesis and macrophages um, that I got excited by that. But uh, I'd love to hear more about that. <laughs> sure. I mean, and that's obviously a huge question, right? Because so many field viruses do cause disease in humans. And if there's one circulating all across Europe, it's something that you know, we will want to be prepared for. Um, so as Elka mentioned, um, using our recombinant virus, um, we wanted to look at um, responses of macrophages um, because a previous paper, we, we'd showed that um, if you infect, you have, you get a very different response if you infect macrophages with Ebola virus, which causes disease in humans versus Reston virus, which to the best of our knowledge, does not cause disease in humans. Um, and so we wanted to use that sort of rubric to see if how these cells responded to infection with Yavu virus. And when we infected them, the cells were well infected, but they basically were silent, which is much more reminiscent of a Reston virus infection of these cells. In fact, they were, if anything, slightly even more muted than um, the infection with Reston. Um, but really, that's um, sort of the only, that's like the main piece of data we have that it, the, the first hint that it might be non pathogenic um, in humans. Um, we are doing collaborations um, with um, um, Heinz Feldman and Andrea Marzi at uh, RML to do um, um, additional studies to look at the potential for. Um, the potential pathogenicity um, of this virus, but we we don't have any we don't have any an answer yet. This is a very very interesting question because right now, so, so it's important to know that all fetal viruses in the U.S. are select agents, or so they are classified as select agents. So it's really difficult to work with these viruses, and of course, they are all BSL four, and so if if there is a way to show that some of these fetal viruses are not pathogenic in humans, so that maybe it could make research on these viruses much easier. So if, for example, it is possible to show that your know, the virus does not cause disease, also I don't really know how to do that because yeah. obviously nobody wants to volunteer as a chance right? yeah. <laughs> to get infected with this virus. But I mean, maybe with animal work and... Um, Kind of very sophisticated cell culture work using primary human cells, using IPC derived human cells to get a better understanding what really defines pathogenicity of these viruses. So maybe we at one point might be able to tell this virus is really not dangerous and maybe we can classify it as a BSL2 virus so that many, many more people can work on these viruses and, and understand their mechanisms better than we do right now because of all these BSL4 restrictions. So even these other fish and uh, snake filoviruses, you you would still have to work on those in a BSL-4? So I would, of course. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if these viruses are not isolated yet from their natural yeah, reservoirs, sure. Adam. Yeah, so we only know the sequence, but... But if, um, they, if they wanted to do the Adam experiment and recover... You'd have to yeah. do it in a four. Okay. Well, yeah, maybe we have the luxury to have a BSL-4 and, and it's yeah. the same for Garbo, right? Of course we use it for work like that because just imagine somebody get infected with a fish fetal virus in Boston. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they would blame you. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. <laughs> wow. They would close the lab. No, that, no, no, no. We don't want that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. You have to have an abundance of caution, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Well, and it would be very embarrassing for the person, right, who wants to get infected with a fish virus. That's not cool. <laughs> yeah. So the BSL-4 lab in Boston, the needle, how long has that now been up and running? 2018. So we got the first viruses, of course, fetal viruses, <laughs> in mm. 2018. Okay. Well, that was a great day for us, yeah. Yeah. That was a long, long slog. Yes, it was. It was painful. Uh, and Gabor, your BSL-4 lab, um, uh, how long has it been functional? 2017. 2017, so similar, yeah. similar time course. Interesting. But with less controversy, right? Were there any, was there any controversy, Gabor, in, in, uh, in 
establishing your laboratory in Boston, there was a significant amount of pushback from the local population uh, to have well, a BSL-4 lab. Our story started with the BSL-3, and mm. our BSL-3 was designed to be elevated to biosafety level 4 at some point. And then we had the budget and we elevated the, the safety level and the okay. technical stuff. So, yes. So everybody knew that we have this strange lab, you know, and for general people, it's, I mean, it's nearly the same. Of course, now we have the space suits, but, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so Alka, I noticed you've published a bit on SARS-CoV-2 as well, right? It, but it yes. didn't, it didn't, it didn't stop you from continuing your filovirus work, right? Well, I mean, every virologist worked on SARS-CoV-2, right? You just had to. And now, and since we have the high containment lab, of course, we volunteered to do infection studies. So Adam did a lot of that. And it was kind of fun, but, you know, I really hate this virus. It's just like the few viruses are so simple and they have this beauty of RNA. So the RNA is kind of beautiful because all of these patterns. And then SARS-CoV-2 is so messy, so we did that work because out of we feel obliged mm. to do it, but we are very happy to go back to fetal viruses now. Uh, Gabor, did you have to do SARS-CoV-2 work? Of course, just yeah. as everybody else. So yeah, and we still have plenty of work with SARS-CoV-2, but started to work again with previous projects. So I'm happy. Great. All right, that's a great story. Thank you, Elke, for. Uh suggesting we do it it's fascinating and maybe not something we would normally have done so I no this is great it's very cool this was so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you for having us it's uh, yeah. fun so uh elke Mühlberger, boston university thank you so much for joining us yeah thank you for having us it was really it was fun and uh adam hume from boston university thank you yes thank you for having us yeah. Adam, you're going to work on filoviruses the rest of your career, you think? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we do a lot of work um, with filoviruses, and um, we've also done a lot of work because we're we're developing all of the inactivation or most of the inactivation mm -hmm. uh, protocols that are required for BSL-4 here. So we do a fair bit with um, NIPA and HNIPA viruses, uh, mm -hmm. arena viruses like Lassa, and uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. So. All right. All the big ones. Yeah. <laughs> and Gabor Kamenesi from the University of Petch. Thank you, Gabor. Appreciate it. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah. And guys, you can um, you can leave now. You can leave the, the Zoom call. We're going to continue on our own. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Bye. a lot. Nice to see you all. Bye -bye. Appreciate Great. it. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was cool. Petch. Yes. I like the little P-E with the accent C-S. I like that. Mm -hmm. I, I'd never heard of it, frankly, but they have BSL-4. How about that? How about that? <laughs> I think that's very cool. Pretty good. Uh, did he say where the other one was? Is it in Budapest? He didn't say. Hey. He didn't say. Uh, all right. I wanted to just do a couple of emails here. I picked out some... Uh, Cool ones, cooler ones from the from the pile. Uh, Rich, can you uh, take that first one? Sure. Bob writes, I'm not looking for this email to be read on the show. Ha. Huh. But honestly, I sort of wish it was because your number 890 was such a perfect start to my Easter Sunday. <laughs> In comparison to the Moth podcast, which Dr. D mentioned, I would easily select Twiv over Moth these days. Actually, Twiv would always be my first choice these days, except when I'm looking to fall asleep, then I would never want to listen to Twiv, lest I nod off and miss a word. Another highlight from my Easter Sunday list, uh, listen to uh, 890 yesterday was Dr. Barker's and anecdote regarding her use of her virus crystal ball. So pleased you shared my appreciation given the title you selected for the episode. 890 was also nice because you included research out of my alma mater, Washington University in St. Louis, Worcester, as we say. Worcester is where I early on learned uh, the issue that prompted this email. Overlapping confidence intervals do not necessarily mean non-significance. Okay. It is certainly true 
that confidence interval for two samples that don't overlap must be significantly different from each other. So one can appropriately say there are obviously they are obviously different because the confidence intervals do not overlap. But one risks making a serious type two error, saying something like the confidence intervals look like they overlap, so they are not significant. As was thankfully beat into my head at Worcester as I worked to analyze my first ever PI data from uh, uh, a random uh, control trial that has gone on to be one of the uh, hun uh, be cited hundreds of times. The issue at hand is not the two samples variances. The issue at hand is the one variance within the sample difference between the two means. Google, a Google search <clears throat> returned a number of hits regarding his confusion. For example, the link below, which he gives, not the best explanation I saw, but I thought you might appreciate checking out a PubMed hit first. I think Dr. Condit made this mistake a few times. I hurt for you and the team when this happens because there must be many other listeners besides me who were corrected on this assumption in the past. I uh, remember early in the pandemic, the team was corrected via email regarding the tales of box plots, i.e. they were not related at all to confidence interval interference. Way more important for me, I also remember you publicly being admonished for uh, being rude to Dr. Depommier. Your 100% apologetic response was so extremely admirable. You, all, you will always have my deepest respect for doing that within a podcast. So this CI thing. <laughs> No comparison in my mind, just something to discuss with the team. I hope you can appreciate why this matters to me, because you personally seem the finest model I know for young researchers. Your banter, as you carefully struggle to get the nuance uh, within a preprint, your thrill of discovery within the dense nature results. I doubt there are many better in the this world than you are. Uh, at these sorts of things. And in my opinion, the world will be a better place if you keep doing what you're doing for decades or at least until everyone forgets about Joe Rogan. <laughs> Bob. Well, that's very nice, Bob. I appreciate that. And with respect, uh, anything that I say uh, about uh, anything having to do with um, significance needs to be disregarded because this is probably one of the lamest parts of my understanding of the sorts of research that we discussed. I never was uh, versed well at all in any kind of um, statistics or understanding uh, the significance of numbers. So I'm in school all the time on this one. That's fine. Yeah, Bob, thanks for uh, your explanation of this. So I definitely recall learning things about, you can't say anything about error bars and whether or not they overlap uh, similar with confidence intervals, as you mentioned. Um, but honestly, I don't think I could have ever explained to you why other than because my statistics professor said so. Um, so um, thank you for actually kind of trying to uh, explain the why this is to me. Um, that was really helpful. Likewise. I, I'm not sure if Bob's the same person that wrote to me separately, but someone did to correct something I said about being upset when um, people in seminars say, well, it's not statistically significant, but it's trending. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, so I was called out on that and I didn't ever really get to respond fully to that, but I appreciate hearing the, the information. Thanks. Uh, Brian, can you take the next one? Sure. Nathan writes, Hello, all. I recently watched TWIV 879, the episode where you discuss how Omicron preferentially utilizes receptor-mediated endocytosis as a route of entry over Tempris 2 dependent membrane fusion. I found this very surprising because I assumed the opposite would be true. Tempris 2 dependent membrane fusion is a faster route of entry for the virus, and it permits cell-cell fusion, which provides the added benefit of entering a new cell without exposure to the extracellular space. Given that Omicron was the most transmissible variant seen yet, why would it evolve to use the slower mechanism of entry? Uh, thank you from Nathan, who is um, a graduate student at the University of Notre Dame. Um, 
I don't know that I can fully answer this for you, Nathan, but one thing that I would think about is that when um, someone talks about um, how transmissible Omicron may be, they're thinking about things that could have to do with how the virus um, sort of spreads between cells in a way that could be modeled in culture or how it evades immune defenses that's, that are only seen in animals or how it is released from the lung um, or from the nose, which again is only going to be seen in animals. And so I'm not sure that we can fully correlate sort of what we see in human epidemiological studies with um, mechanisms of entry quite that well. Yeah, I, I think that uh, the, the paper that we discussed, they did the experiments in the right cells, right? They were explants from the human respiratory tract, but it could still be slightly different in an actual infected animal. But I also think what you said, Brian, is correct. I think immune evasion yeah. for um, Omicron is the key to its rapid spread. And so right. this may not matter. <laughs> right. right. And I also think is you have to be careful to put human um, <laughs> logic onto what, right. on yeah, the Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. Because you're thinking like a human and maybe that's not appropriate. I just don't know. Um, Kathy, can you take the next one? Okay, uh, this is from Alan. Thank you as always for your continuing commitment to educating us mere mortals and yourselves on all things virological, immunological, epidemiological, epistemological, ontological, meteorological, and whimsically illogical. The abstract below, which you have not hitherto discussed on TWIV, clearly indicates that TWIV saves lives. All the best, Alan. And then he cites something called... Uh, Journal of Clinical Ambivalence, Game Changing Immunogenicity of Pandemic Era Podcasts, a Blinded Placebo Controlled Trial, um, with several authors listed. Um, I haven't had a chance. Should I summarize this? Should I read through it? Or well, can somebody uh, else jump it's in? It's funny. <laughs> it's a joke. It's a, it's a joke. So yeah, you can I, I figured that. that. <laughs> so um, I can't summarize it because I haven't read the whole thing. I can jump to the conclusion and recommendation. Two of listeners were significantly less likely to experience severe COVID disease than either the placebo or control groups and exhibited a 100% survival rate. In short, TWIV saves lives. Given the clear evidence of immunogenicity and lowered mortality imparted by TWIV, we recommend that the CDC immediately recommend broad TWIV listening for the general population. A follow-up study is needed to determine the best age groups, but we suggest that in the meantime, ages 14 and over should be encouraged to listen at least twice weekly. So. I think this is so funny. They, uh, where did it, where did this, who cooked this up? This guy cooked I it up. The author. Alan. Alan cooked yes. it up. Yeah. Okay. yeah I, I can't get the middle author, but the, the first author is Believe Me. Yeah. And the uh, final author is Annotation. Yeah. And we, uh, we, okay. we Chikarful. How, how would, how would this, Wiki Carful? I don't remember. I don't know. Anyway. Is it something about being careful? No. I, yeah. We, so, uh, Alan, you have to write back and explain that part to us, or somebody will. Yeah, so, uh, so this is this is like a phony. It's a phony trial. Study. It's great though. But three hundred yeah. three thousand yeah. two hundred internet users, two groups. Uh, first listened to two or three podcasts a week, and the other was the control arm. And um, the, the <laughs> it says in previous work on podcast content, Twiv was the most consistently accurate if grumpy source of virological data. Accused but the authors there were cute. Uh, Balalaika, Viola, et al. <laughs> <laughs> and accordingly, we use TWIV and occasional epitopes of TWIM as our test material. And epitopes. They, they, then they say, we evenly divided group one into a TWIV and beta placebo subgroup. The alpha group, which is TWIV, was provided with two epitopes of TWIV weekly, plus one available, one of TWIM on a USB flash drive. The beta group received an assortment of podcasts on topics like business, barbershop, harmony, or Beyonce. <laughs> the accounting firm of Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. Yeah, good. <laughs> secured all codes in a locked manila envelope. Um, and then there's one more thing I wanted to... And then they go on to say that, you know, there's better survival in the TWIF group and so forth. But they say down here, 
Uh, the beta group achieved a remarkable and unexpected negative score on the second test. We're unsure how this is possible, but we hypothesize that some placebo drives may have been contaminated with Joe Rogan podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do think that the beginning of the background also is uh, worth mentioning. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic appears to have been paralleled by a misinformation pandemic on the subjects of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, viruses in general, vaccines, equine dewormers, and the technical feasibility of man manufacturing microchips small enough to be injected using a normal <laughs> clinical syringe. That's great. It's really very clever, Alan. Really good job. Good, I, I enjoy it. satire, yes. So those who want to read this, all the, the letters are all posted in there, uh, you know, completely. So you can read through the whole thing. And those are posted on the web page, not yeah. necessarily in the YouTube links down below, but on the web page. I love it. This is just This great. is worth reading. Great. Yes. All right, I uh, will do the last two because one is short. A Alec writes, hi, Twivers. I'm listening to number 890, and I just heard Rich's rant, little rant about encodes for. When are you all going to address data point? <laughs> Seriously, though, thanks for all you do. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I, I had not thought of that. I was. I uh, know, neither did I. That was a point is me, good, right? Absolutely right. Mm. And uh, Walt writes, First, Vincent's comments that science is politically neutral is simply false. I hope I didn't say that. I, maybe I said it should be false. It shouldn't be. It should be neutral, but it isn't. I agree. Look at Peter Hotez's accounts of why Stalin pushed Lysenkoism or your wonderful number 773 guest. Who is who is that? Twiv773. Um, Laurie Garrett. <laughs> You go, who about who pays the well off versus who benefits all, but especially the less well off from public health and the potential, the political potential of subjugating people who won't tow the party line are clear. Yes, I believe it's not just potential in 2022. Idealists looking to make a better world for all need to use a system built upon the notion of enlightened self interest and increase the enlightened part. That's your job. Thank you for your excellence at it. So public interest might more often win out over the tendencies toward oligarchic power. Second, by visiting the Atlantic from a browser that stores no cookies, I can confirm the Atlantic story Amy liked was not paywalled for non-subscribers, at least not for a first-time visitor. And while the circulation isn't up with the AARP bulletin, <laughs> I didn't see other mass media publications that would consider a story of that heft. I think if you visit uh, the Atlantic from the same computer, it counts you. And then after so many yeah, visits, you can't that's go right. anymore. That's why I subscribed. I kept uh, burning out my free freebies. Same thing with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, yeah. I've, I've lost all my, but I don't want to subscribe to the Wall Street Journal. I simply don't. Um, yeah, I, I understand. And, and today is even worse because, you know, a judge decides that we can't wear masks. And I think for... Law and health to, to intersect is absurd. And um, I don't think that's right. I don't think uh, a court should decide your health. You should you should uh, have health independent of that, but that's what's happened. And they could maybe even use like scientific citations when talking about things like that. Uh-huh. No, it's all about constitutional <laughs> right, right? And uh, so I, in protest, I wore a mask on New Jersey Transit today, even though you don't have to, because I don't, want the mandate broken by a court. That's not where it should be done, in my opinion, which I understand is is uh, irrelevant. But uh, the, New uh, the subway, you still have to wear a mask, which I think is smart because they're thinking about the science, not the law. Okay, let's do uh, some picks of the week. Brianne, what do you have for us this week? Uh, so I have today's astronomy picture of the day. <laughs> um, and I have seen quite a few very good ones recently. Uh, but um, thanks to Kathy, I have astronomy picture of the day uh, open up whenever I open a new browser window. And I've actually had multiple people in my office today comment on this picture when I've opened a browser window while they were in my office. Um, so uh, I thought that this one was particularly uh, beautiful. It's called Stars and Globules in the Running Chicken Nebula. Um, <laughs> I was not aware there was a running chicken nebula, and that is pretty fun. 
Um, but I just thought this was a really beautiful image. Um, if people aren't paying attention, yesterday's also was quite beautiful. Um, but every person who has walked into my office and noticed this when I was opening uh, a browser window today has commented on how nice it was. Kathy's got me hooked too. And I was puzzling over it. I noticed this when I was puzzling over it. And I'm wondering, where do you see a running chicken? I don't, maybe on the... They say the whole thing, but I see, you know, sort of uh, uh, mid horizontal line over on the right, there's something that could be a running chicken. Yeah. Is the chicken sideways <laughs> or up and down? I guess I, on the left, maybe there's a sideways chicken. I'm not sure. At any rate, I'm it's not beautiful. seeing it either. It's nice, but yeah, I don't. Yesterday's is pretty maybe, cool too. Maybe you yeah. have to be an astronomer. Maybe. Yeah. Yesterday's was also really good. Wow. It's gorgeous. Yes. Yes. Portugal. I So when we first had the internet years ago and you had a browser, remember? It was Netscape something was the browser. Yeah. That I discovered this site and I actually had it as my startup site for a while. And then I, I just moved away from it. But it was one of those places early on that was very cool. Kathy, what do you have for us? I picked something that I got from a listener, from Justin. Uh, it's a bio-render poster builder. And I haven't really explored it in great depth. When you click on the link, you can see them showing you a demo of how you can move images in and move them Ooh. around and change the formats. And um, you can choose you know, different size for your starting poster. It says you can sign up for free um, with BioRender. And uh, so that seems like it might make it worthwhile. Maybe there's more features if you have the paid version version. I'm lucky enough that our department has paid big bucks to get um, the paid version, uh, a license for it. So uh, I'm hoping that if we need to do this, we can use this. But it, it looks like it might be helpful for those who are planning to go to meetings like maybe ASV and other meetings and present posters. Wow, how that. times have changed. Yep. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yep, yeah, they indeed have. I yeah. think it looks really useful. <laughs> yes. Rich, what do you have for us? So uh, I have a uh, novella. Uh, it's the notable because this is the very last we will see of the Expanse science fiction series. The novella was recently published called The Sins of Our Fathers, an Expanse novella by James S.A. Corey. I confess that I'm only about halfway through it. It, it, uh, but it so far is uh, up to snuff relative to the rest of the expanse stuff. You can't read it on its own. You have to be an expanse freak, okay, uh, before uh, you get the whole context. But I thought uh, this, by the way, I credit my son with pointing this out to me. Um, I thought uh, uh, having picked uh, most of the uh, expanse novels and novellas in the past, I had to complete the arc. And here it is. So I am not all the way up to date yet. This one comes after the final novel. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, and it, uh, and it's uh, the, the context is interesting in that regard because so you are, um, uh, you are a reader of this stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, good. So have you read the final novel? I have not. Okay. So I won't say anything more. Okay. <laughs> 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 but you, when you read the final uh, novel, you may say, uh, okay, now what? Okay, so, so this this is a now what? Okay. So I remember you picking the, the final, and now this is the final final? So, <laughs> you know, you need some, yeah. Okay, so the deal is that the Expanse series is a series of uh, nine full-blown novels, but they're sort of... Uh, 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 interwoven with a handful, maybe about six uh, of novellas, which are really just kind of, uh, they're not even quite short. Well, they might be sh uh, uh, short stories. Okay. They only take an hour or two to read. They don't even have chapters. They just got, you know, sort of punctuated sections and that kind of stuff. And they're sort of uh, lots of times peripheral to the main story, though you find, so for example, there's one, uh, I forget the name of it, but it uh, is basically 
essentially a biography of one of the main characters. All right. And it really enhances your appreciation for that character. You can get most of it uh, from the novels themselves, but the, the novellas uh, uh, really, really help out. And it's important if you're going to get into this to go to Wikipedia, okay, and look up the Expanse series, and it will list all of the novels, and it'll list all of the novellas, and it will also tell you what sequence you should read them in, okay? In other words, where to read the novellas. Because if you read them too soon, they don't necessarily make sense, or they might have spoilers in them. So you got to read them in the right sequence. So, so they're kind of like extended <laughs> footnotes in a way. Yeah, or they could okay. be. They had sure. Yeah. Yeah. And they're fun because they're a quick read. You know, mm-hmm. they they give you all of the flavor of an expanse novel without. Uh, you know, it's a. It's, I, I was the cliff notes comes to mind, book. but that's not true. <laughs> yeah, the the books are huge. Okay, and the novellas are sort of a quick quick read so you need a little hit in between novels you got this got it neat uh, my pick is a youtube channel called baumgartner restoration and this is just amazing i've, I've watched two of these only but um julian baumgartner owns a rest, an art restoring studio in chicago and he records videos about how he restores paintings and it is amazing. I just never paid much attention to this. And he's very engaging. And um, he, he'll have each video is on a painting he's restoring. And I watched one where, you know, these are really nice paintings. And one painting, they had covered it in a layer of varnish. And it had turned yellow and cracked. So he had to use a scalpel to chip off the varnish. I mean, this thing was three by three feet. It took him so long and he would speed up the video so you could see how it transforms it and then of course as he picked off the varnish it pulled little bits of paint off which he then had to go back and retouch he has this huge palette of all different colors that he can touch and it looks beautiful in the end he cleans it he shows all these tables he has throughout the studio i kind of like he's there in by himself in this studio and it's kind of like here the incubator and I love watching him run around and carry the canvases around and remount them. And in the end, they're just gorgeous. They're just gorgeous. And this, this, what he does is amazing. So I think this is really incredible. He's had one where he was a religious painting that had cracked. It was an oil painting and the oil paint had cracked. So he had to retouch the cracks away in certain places. So he had to match the paint. And he uses this paint. It's not oil paint. It's a resin-based paint, which is removable. So he said, if some point in the future they want to take away the restoration, they can. But it just transforms the paint. He's just cleaning it. It just transforms it. It's so cool. Um, so I, I highly recommend, if you're interested in seeing how uh, you would restore a painting. Um, so I uh, watched this uh, one, the restoration of... Ava Maria, and I agree. This is absolutely fascinating. And the, you know, the care and the artistry that goes into this. One of the things that I really liked was that there were uh, very significant pieces of this. This is a, a oil on wood, mm-hmm. or something like that. And the paint is really like thick. So it, you know, you can pull it off like puzzle pieces in places where it's really separated, which he does. And then, you know, fixes it up and puts it back together. But there are there are areas in this where there's huge bits missing yeah. that he then retouches by painting in what he thinks would logically have been there. But it's deliberately done in a in a special style that makes it obvious that hmm. to the to the person viewing it is. This is what it ought to look like, but I'm not trying to be the artist here, okay? Yeah, sure. I want you to know that I filled this in. It's really, really well done. Yeah. Very. He has, what, a, um, what a talent. Oh, he's incredibly talented and patient too, right? This takes... Yeah. He says, I can't spend all day on one painting. I have to mix it up because it's too much. He has this big table. It must be 10 by 10 feet. It's made of metal <clears throat> and he uses it to heat... It reminds me of a big gel dryer, okay, because he puts the painting on it and he puts a piece of plastic and then he applies a vacuum to evacuate it and then turns on the heat. 
and you can see the moisture coming through the vacuum pipes because he wants to dry it out before doing it. It's just like a gel dryer, which, which you would have much <laughs> hotter, right? You remember a small version of it? Sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's so funny, which we still have, of course. Anyways, it's just talent, uh, lovely craft, and I'm glad to see that there's still people uh, practicing that for sure. Uh, we have a listener pick from Jay. Uh, this The link is to a talk on the current state of time measurement with the improving accuracy of atomic clocks and its reliance on advances in ultra-low temperature physics. The technology involved in reaching within a pico-kelvin of absolute zero and therefore the limit set by the uncertainty principle is impressive. This gives a clock accuracy of one second in the age of the universe. The implications in many fields, including gravitational wave detection and quantum computing, are intriguing. You may want to skip the first half hour, which is fairly basic. So he provides a link. Uh, he or she provides a link to time, Einstein, and the coolest stuff in the universe. Um, it kind of reminds me of the cooling down the, the, the web thing, right? Which Dixon <laughs> talked about last week, getting it really cold. All right, thank you, Jay. That'll do it for TWIV891. You can find it, the show notes, which we talked about before. You can find links to the letters and all the articles. We well, A couple of articles involved in today's as well. Microbe.tv slash TWIV. If you want to send us a question or comment or a pick, TWIV at microbe.tv. And if you enjoy what we do, consider supporting us financially. Microbe.tv slash contribute. We have a number of ways you can do that, including we have the address of the incubator there on the site. Uh, and your contributions are U.S. federal tax deductible. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Conda is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Brianne Barker is at Drew University Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. <laughs> Thanks. It was great to be here. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.